Welcome to Worship with North Haven Church on this Good Friday. Pretty peculiar Good Friday in living memory, but a Good Friday that may not be as far removed from that first fateful Friday as we'd like to think. It's a time when the disciples were all huddled in darkness. They had run from Jesus, run from the idea that maybe they were going to be killed with him. Fleed and hid. And we too are shut up in our own homes, locked away from much of the world, hiding from a disease that could kill us or at least those we love as well. Yes, we have a lot in common with those disciples on this Good Friday. But, but, even now, oh, I don't want to jump ahead to Easter, but even now, even as Christ hangs on that cross season, even as we huddle in our homes, make no mistake about it, God is here with us, just as he was with Jesus. And Jesus may have words for us tonight from the cross in this place. Last night for Monday Thursday, we heard from Jesus for the first three sayings he said from the cross and three, three North Haven voices. Tonight we'll finish up with the last four, with four North Haven voices reflecting on each of those sayings and North Haveners and then interspersed in there playing music as well. I hope you find this as a meaningful service as I have. Let us continue in worship, North Haven. its presence, its distribution, the desire we all have for at least some is the driving force in this world. Power is exerted on the playground and in the boardroom, on the battlefield and in the pulpit. Any person who says they have no need for power is in denial or delusional. Disruption is always a challenge to our power. Have you ever thought of first world conveniences is power. I have never considered the power I have in my life until now. The coronavirus is the great disruptor. It is an enemy that we cannot shoot, 
bomb or vote out of office. It is stealing lives. The tentacles of its massive power has infiltrated almost every facet of our homes, neighborhoods, workplaces, and yes, even our churches. By my count, last Sunday was only the third Sunday we have not met, but it seems like months. Where is God in the midst of the pandemic? When Jesus uttered the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, he was not asking a question. He was praying the 22nd Psalm. The Psalms is the Jewish prayer book and hymnal. In our limited understanding, this was a derelict prayer. How could Jesus accuse God the Father of abandonment? But this was not an accusation, but instead a holy conversation within the deep confines of the Trinity. Stanley Hauervoss, in his little devotional, The Cross-Shattered Christ, says, quote, This, meaning the crucifixion, is not a dumb show that some abstract idea of God appears to go through to demonstrate that he or she really has our best interest at heart. No. This is the Father's deliberately giving his Christ over to a deadly destiny so that our destiny would not be determined by death. Howard Vostin quotes Rowan Williams. Here, meaning the cross, is where we see the sheer unimaginable differentness of God. Howard Voss continues, our idea of God, our assumption that God must possess the sovereign power to make everything turn out all right for us, at least in the long run, is revealed by Jesus's cry of abandonment to be the idolatry, idolatry that it really is. These words from the cross and the cross itself mean that the Father is to be found when all traces of power, at least as we understand power, are absent, when all forms of human authority are lost. End of quote. We celebrate Good Friday as the day when the world goes dark, a darkness anticipating the brilliant light of the resurrection. Today on this Good Friday, we celebrate the cross with a real shadow covering everything in the form of the virus. We are facing some of the same uncertainty those early, early followers may have felt at the foot of the cross. Control, which is a form of power, is in short supply. We are literally praying the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. God is not like us as much as we wish God is like us. It is idolatry to believe God's love for us translates into everything turning out good for us as we understand good. That is true because we do not really know what good is for us. We want everything back to normal now without considering the real possibility that all kinds of new normal are going to come out of this crisis. We have learned over the course of the last few weeks that we are in control of very little. Control is a facade and safety is an illusion. More than ever, we must live our lives in the confidence that we belong to God and therefore belong to each other. Amen.
thirst. That detail about the crucifixion of Jesus is provided only in the book of John. John 19, 28 says, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. So what enters our minds as we reflect on those words, I thirst? My first thought is that they emphasize the humanity of Jesus and the intensity of his suffering. Or perhaps Jesus' words had only a little to do with his physical needs and more to do with his longing to be with God. He who said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, now knows, now knows that his own thirst for righteousness will soon be satisfied. What Old Testament prophecies are Jesus fulfilling? Among the many, Psalm 22, which some call the resurrection, or the crucifixion psalm, begins with the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And continues, A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my raiment they cast lots. When Jesus said, I thirst, he is showing his awareness of his divine destiny. He is fulfilling his purpose according to what has long been the plan of God. He is showing his willingness to drink the cup of suffering. He is saying that the crucifixion is no accident, but is instead a deliberate self-offering. Remember the thirst of Jesus for us as you hear these words from Jesus to us as expressed by Mother Teresa. No matter how far you may wander, no matter how often you forget me, no matter how many crosses you may bear in this life, there is one thing I want you to remember always, one thing that will never change. I thirst for you just as you are. You don't need to change to believe in my love, for it will be your belief in my love that will change you. You forget me, and yet I am seeking you every moment of the day. I am standing at the door to your heart and knocking. Do you find this hard to believe? Then look at the cross. Look at my heart that was pierced for you. Have you not understood my cross? Then listen again to the words that I spoke there for they tell you clearly why I endured all this for you. I thirst for you. All your life I've been looking for your love. You have tried many other things in your search for happiness. Why not try opening your heart to me? When you open your heart, when you come close enough, you will hear me say to you again and again, not in mere human words, but in spirit. No matter what you have done, I love you for your own sake. Come to me with your misery and your sin, with your trouble and needs, and with all your longing to be loved. I stand at the door to your heart and knock. Open to me, for I thirst for you.
It is finished, said Jesus. Not a statement made to anyone in particular, but a simple declaration of what had been done. A word, if spoken to anyone at all, was spoken to the Father by the Son. And what did the people hear in this word uttered on the cross? For those who mocked and jeered, it was defeat, surrender, and acknowledgement that all was lost. But there were others there who mourned the passing of this one in whom they had placed their hopes their dreams, their very lives. And in shock disbelief, their hopes turned to fears while their joy turned to tears. Some heard what they had hoped to hear while others heard what they had feared. I wonder what his mother thought as she saw this her child through her tears. Did she recall the words of Simeon spoken at the temple so long ago that he would be opposed and a sword would pierce her very soul? And that sword that pierced her soul would soon pierce his side as those who loved him mourn to see him die. It is finished. But had those who walked with him really used their eyes to see and their ears to hear, they would have heard in his voice, not despair, not surrender, not defeat, but a simple acknowledgement that what he had come to do was now complete. Had they heard, they may have remembered that day in Galilee, a day that should have left them numb, because on that day he told them, although it seems they did not hear, that he would be betrayed and killed. And so what does he do? He set his face to Jerusalem. And what was resolved on that forgotten day has now been accomplished as we hear him say, it is finished. And so as we gaze upon the cross, we see in awe he who came from heaven above, not just to die, but to love. A love so full, a love so complete, a love so powerful, that the very gates of hell crumbled in defeat. And as the one who made the planets and the stars, the one to whom the angels their alleluias cried went to the cross for you and for me and died. It is finished. And in this love that gave all that even God could give, I learned not how to die, but how to truly live. It is finished. It is done. Hate has lost. And love has won. It is finished.
Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's the last thing Jesus says before he dies, but it's really nothing new for him, is it? Jesus lived his whole life surrendered to the Father. In the Gospel of John, he tells us that I came to do not my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's just recently prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me, but, but not my will, but yours be done. And even in his deepest moment of grief, it's the word of God that Jesus uses to name his pain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, quoting Psalm 22. And then finally, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus lived, surrendered to the Father. And it's no surprise that he would die the same way. It's hard to imagine a word, a word that is less American than the word surrender, isn't it? Like a good American, much of my time and energy goes to becoming the master of my own fate, the captain of my own ship. I achieve and I build and I hoard so that I don't have to depend on God or anyone else so that I can win, not surrender. I'm a good Christian. I'm happy to serve God with my talents my time, my life, but surrender them entirely? The idea just makes me squeamish. What control would that leave me? I think one of the gifts that this nasty disease gives us is the chance to learn how little we are in control anyway. The jobs that many of us used to find meaning drastically changed or even disappeared overnight. The relationships that give us meaning have been radically redefined and distanced. Our illusion that we are in control of our lives melted away quickly. Sometimes surrendering to God means giving up control. But more often I think it means giving up our illusion of control. We stop pretending. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus is nailed to a cross when he says this. Has been for hours. He's going to die, and nothing he can do at this point can change that fact. The choice isn't between life or death. That choice has already been made. It's between dying well and at peace in the hands of God or not. And surrender means accepting reality as it is putting ourselves in the hands of God, come what may. 
accepting that I am not in control. I am not in charge. I cannot hoard enough wealth to protect me from the unknown, and I cannot make myself so useful to protect me from obsolescence. I cannot become so lovable that I'll never get hurt. Surrender means giving up our illusions so that we can give ourselves to the one who reigns over life and death. It means letting go of a false reality so that we can take hold of true life and the true God instead of all the idols we use to perpetuate our illusions. Will Willimon says that one way you can tell a true God from a homemade idol is that the idols tend to promise us continuity, immortality, and security. And here on Good Friday, we reckon with the difficult truths. If even the Jesus we worship was subjected to death, then we aren't likely to escape it either. If even he who is the very word of God, if even he suffered at the hands of others, experiencing pain and ridicule, ridicule and betrayal and abandonment, well, then we will too. We cannot acquire enough power or make ourselves so lovable to escape it. Else he would have. In this life, pain is inevitable. Suffering will come. But so will beauty and love and goodness. And the more that we fight in futility to escape the pain, the more of the beauty we're assured to miss as well. When we surrender to the true God, the crucified King, we're not promised that He protects us from suffering, only that He gives us the strength to endure it, to endure it, to find meaning in it, to find hope in it, even in the suffering. Father, into your hands we commit our spirits.
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.